face. <laughs> all the faces I was making on that screen, it's, it's way too high down. So as Andre said, my name is Matt McLaughlin, and I'm the Director of Technology at Carpe Data. So February of this year, before I moved to Lisbon to open up a new office here, I formally transitioned the structure of our product and technology team in order to prepare for upcoming growth and also to make sure that we fix some of these collaboration issues that we had between product and technology. In order to deliver this message to the company, I did it all hands. And not only did we just want to be transparent, but we thought that by explaining why we were making these changes, people would be much more likely to adopt them. So in this presentation, you'll see a few slides from that slideshow, and also what are hopefully some relevant team structure concepts. First, very quickly, me, one, I would never wear a suit, so that's about as fancy as I ever get. Um, but I've been with my same founder since 2011. I've really grown with the company. I actually started in an entry-level position way back in 2011. What I've been doing the past few years, though, which is very, very fun, is serving as the business and technology theme, meaning every single engineering and product development goal we had essentially had to be executed by me. So I had a lot of free time and made a lot of friends that way. <laughs> so very quickly, this is our company Carpet Data at a glance. Mostly I want you to focus on the fact that we're about 60 employees and we're gonna be growing over this coming year. And also we now have three different office locations. So what Carpet Data does is we provide online content to help identify and provide insight into risks for insurance companies. And these risks can either be based on an individual or a small or medium sized business. So now I want to cover a few very, um, very simple team structure concepts. So at a certain point, when your team gets too big, what's really posing the problem is the number of links between the people on the team, and that's covered by the team scaling fallacy. So you can see here in this chart, with six people, you have 15 links. So that's the link between person A and B, A and C, etc. And it clearly very quickly gets out of hand. So what you don't realize is when your team isn't being that productive and it's already a big team, Adding more members only exacerbates the issue. So you're adding all these extra layers of coordination and communication, and that actually lowers team productivity and individual productivity. So Jeff Bezos is the founder of Amazon, and he came up with a two-pizza team rule that reflects the team scaling fallacy. What he says is he doesn't want to have any teams that are so large that they cannot be fed by just two pizzas in a team meeting. So obviously this can change the how hungry you are, how good the pizzas are, but it is something that once again keeps in mind that you're adding so much overhead uh, that it is sometimes smart to stay around seven or eight as your maximum team size. And lastly, who here is aware of the Spotify squad model? So it's fairly well known, I will not be able to do it justice, but if you don't and you have any interest in team structure at all, please go to YouTube. There are some really, really good videos uh, that you should check out, mainly for this talk, uh, what we did is we took their squad, so their concept of squad, which is the, the basic unit in their structure, and their squads are um, small, autonomous, cross-functional teams that are all working towards the same goal, and that's kind of what we ended up using for our uh, teams that we created. So the operating structure model is a essentially a complement to some of these formal models that we see. So. By a show of hands, who here has ever had to work around the boss to get something done? Are your bosses here? I mean, I assume that's pretty much everyone. <laughs> so, or at other times, you probably have a colleague who has an extended absence and you need to cover for them. So these types of adaptive behaviors are covered by this operating structure model. And what's important to realize is, as, as much as you can have very theoretically sound uh, product structure models uh, like the Spotify squad model, there's always going to be a degree of tension with kind of the organic and informal uh, models that, that appear. So what the challenge is, the challenge is, or I should say the opportunity, is for the company to understand which of these productive tendencies are ones that they actually want to formalize. Um, if these behaviors are, are working for the team, then it's something that should be approved and formalized, and therefore the people who are engaging those behaviors 
feel more comfortable um, engaging, I guess, within those new boundaries. So very briefly, I want to take you through kind of how Carpe Data's product and tech resources work together or really didn't work that well together. So this is a brick wall. Um, but very briefly, so we had an agile development cycle team. So it was a, a team where every week we had releases, we had our, our scrum ceremonies and artifacts, we had a very tight loop and we knew what we were doing within that group. But what we did not do a good job of was incorporating everyone else on the outside looking in. So often, for example, we had data science on the outside. So for a while we were thinking of data science as just using kind of our data exhaust. So at the end of our process related to uh, all the risks that we found for an individual, data science was then going to create a model. But at a certain point, once it really got integrated, we realized that wasn't working because we were making decisions on some of the data that ended up in their pipeline without them even knowing or it was too late when we involved them. So that was something we definitely had to fix. And then also, our product team, which was also not co-located with us in Santa Barbara, they were in Hartford, Connecticut, they were I guess somewhat happy to be on the periphery because once this wheel got going, it was very hard to kind of get your hand in there, you're gonna get it stuck or caught. So they, they like to go through me, uh, which was fine. But the important thing about our product team is because we ultimately deliver products to the insurance industry, despite being a data company, they had all the nuanced knowledge of what would really make um, an impressive and quality driven product, whereas our Agile development cycle team, we were just a bunch of data and tech people. So we really had no idea. We took care of the low hanging fruit, but after that, um, we, we made the best decisions we could, but they weren't that good at decisions. So there were quite a few warning signs. Yeah, this is me. Uh, there were quite a few warning signs uh, related to you know when we needed to make this change. Uh, one of them, obviously, team size is increasing. We steadily increased uh, linearly after raising some money a few years ago. Um, but one day, I walked into our conference room for our daily stand-up, and that was only a portion of the, or that was the development cycle team in the daily stand-up, and people couldn't fit. Everyone was against the wall because any tighter, we wouldn't be able to fit in there. So that made it pretty obvious that now that we're raising money again, we were going to need, something had to change. Um, we didn't have, we didn't want to have people outside the room. We thought they would they'd feel bad about that. Um, so one of the biggest issues that we had was the communication stream. So we had individuals within the development cycle team whose focus jumped every day, every week. Um, they didn't know what they were going to be working on next. And because of that, we also had an issue with our product team who they wouldn't even know what the correct communication channel was. was. Uh, who do I go to if I have a question about X or Y? So that was obviously an issue. And once again, they would just send it to me and I would figure it out. Um, but what was also really important about that was those big, difficult problems that really make a meaningful impact on a product, those weren't being tackled because people, once again, didn't know if that was something they should be worried about because who knows in a week whether they'd have that same focus. So it made it a lot easier for us to just be reactive and work on incremental gains and obvious, uh, obvious improvements, but not really get down to the core of what makes the product better. And then last, prioritization bottleneck looked a lot like the guy in front of you today. Uh, everything, everything ended up somehow coming to me, and it was my job to piece everything together. And if you've ever played the game of telephone, there's a drastic reduction and distortion of information. So no amount of work that I was going to do was going to result in the correct pr priority being chosen. And in many cases, it was just who was the loudest advocate. Oh, this ticket has two loud advocates. I'm going to go with that answer, whether or not, whether or not it's the right answer. That was certainly an issue. And then I wanted to bring up the bus factor, which is a, uh, a risk factor related to having the necessary knowledge and capabilities on a team to deliver a project. So this is based on the phrase, uh, if you were to be hit by a bus. So if you have one person on the team that is capable of delivering a project based on their capabilities and information, that's way too few. You want to have at least six people or seven people who have to get hit by a bus before your project stops. Not that I want anyone here to get hit by a bus. It is dangerous out here. There are a lot more buses here than in Singapore, right? I can tell you that. So one thing that I wanted to drive home with my team was kind of a culture that respects the is-ought fallacy. Has anyone heard of the is-ought fallacy? So it's a pretty basic concept, but 
It essentially says, just because something is a certain way does not mean it ought to be. So it really is just, it's really just creating a questioning culture. So what I wanted to remind everyone of was the way everything was before was a remnant of our former company. It was a remnant of a smaller team size and much less complexity in process. So the obvious proposal was break apart those two teams you saw uh, previously into three, uh, three teams based on our core product area. And of course, in this model, we're valuing the depth of knowledge over a breadth of knowledge and also uh, sustained participation uh, by, the, uh, by our team members versus sporadic intermittent participation. So our two main products, one are based on individuals, and that's our claims product, and then the other is based on smaller, medium-sized businesses and finding those risks. That's commercial. But the most important team to me, honestly, is platform. Uh, this is in no way sexy, logging, metrics, uh, data, science infrastructure, but this was going to be the team that was gonna allow the rest of them uh, to progress in the way they needed to. So I also wanted to make sure that people felt, even though they weren't really working in a ge uh, revenue generating team, they were still adding a ton of value through the shared processes, methodologies, code standards, etc. So you might be wondering who those creepy eyes belong to. And those are our GC or general contributors. So not we didn't stuff everyone onto a team because our teams would have been too big. But the general contributor's job are to essentially kind of have eyes over the entire process and really help break down whatever barriers might end up being created within each team. And from there, they would be the ones who would be communicating and making sure that this team wasn't reinventing the wheel and trying to do something that that team's already done. So the roles on these teams that I really wanted to highlight was first the product owner. I mean, I mean it's, a, it's very basic, but we were really missing the concept of a product owner who was a customer and market-driven resource. Uh, they were out here in Hartford, Connecticut, not really letting anyone else, or not letting anyone else know, but they just weren't, they didn't feel comfortable, I would say, contributing um, in a continuous manner. So that was something obviously missing. How do you have a good product without really knowing the customer? And no one is born knowing what insurance customers are like, which is good. Um, so then the other position is our BA, Scrum Master, BA standing for Business Analyst. It was their job to take the timelines, priorities, and the scope that the product owner set forth and figure out how to execute. So they're removing blockers, setting up meetings, and otherwise allocating resources. And then the other roles in the team that actually do the work, the engineers, quality assurance, data science, the only thing that really changed in their roles were they were way more upstream and connected, so they were able to kind of make good inferences to understand uh, whatever gaps and requirements there were because they're now a lot closer to the product owner and involved in the process. The first one being an increase in ownership. So this is something that I wanted to, once again, drive home to everyone in the room, which was just because there's a decreased scope of your responsibility and ownership, you will have an increased depth of responsibility that will result in a net gain. Because one thing I didn't want people to think was, well, before I got to work on everything, now I work in one little area. And then I also really like the W's and the H's being a good way to summarize um, kind of the, I guess, the, the high level changes. So what changes with the who? Well, now it's formalized. The communication channels are set. You know who to go to, and that's not gonna change on a weekly basis. And then also the why, there's so much more clarity with the product owner's presence and everyone benefits from that why. And then what I really like about the when, what, and the how is the team decides, which is um, these are autonomous teams and if one team decides that a one week release cycle doesn't fit for them, then they can do a three week. So it helps these couple the teams in that way so that they can be as efficient as they need to be. One, I think, core element of having a team-based structure work is making sure that you have people across multiple teams all, um, all reporting up through the same manager. So that once again helps people uh, remove, um, remove whatever blinders they might have on and also helps the functional managers break ties uh, whenever that's necessary when it relates to uh, resource allocation. As part of this presentation, I also wanted to make sure people were very, very clear that this is not a silver bullet. There will be issues. There's no such thing as a perfect structure. So I just wanted them to make sure that they were aware of these uh, potential issues like silos and lack of communication, because that would help them, once they're aware, then mitigate those issues. Um, and once again, the I think the core concept in any company is it doesn't matter what team you're on or what you're trying to accomplish. 
as long as you're focused on company goals, that can overcome whatever issues you have being myopic and focused on your own team. So there have been some early successes, but what I've seen as the most incredible success is the depth of our knowledge of the product and what we're actually trying to achieve has just increased tenfold. We've really taken the time to understand which areas we need to make, we need to improve our products. And these were the areas that nobody would touch before because it's gonna be a two or three week long slog for requirements and jumping around to different parties. So that has been super beneficial for us. And then there have been some dual challenge, uh, some early challenges. I think um, one thing that's been tough is those general contributors have a really tough job now. There was one daily stand up for them before, now there are three, and it's just tough to kind of it's tough to really keep your pulse on multiple teams at once. But that's why we pay them. That's their job. So hopefully they can overcome that. I wouldn't say that's them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, also, we're not sure yet if we have over-specialized too soon, because that was one of the things we were warned about, because we're still a small company. So you obviously, if you have eight developers working for you, and all of a sudden one leaves and he was one out of two on the team, then you might be in trouble. So, so far, we're, we're okay with it, um, but it might occur. What's next? Um, I'd love to do a formal evaluation study just to kind of survey everyone individually and figure out how this impacted them. Uh, from maybe a career growth perspective, but mostly how is this company working more uh, more efficiently than it was before? And then also, I just want to make sure that our company sticks with this culture of um, related to the ISOC fallacy, a culture of inspection and adaptation, making sure that we can evolve uh, to, to serve whatever, uh, whatever growth our company is going to be um, accommodating in the next few years. So lastly, I just want to thank you all for the time. Hopefully I didn't speak too quick. Uh, Tanya, I told you I'd speak more quickly than you did, uh, but I really appreciate being here and hopefully you learned something today. Thank you.